Troodontids are a problem, and not just because of their taxonomy, but also because their teeth are kind of funny when you look at them and compare them to other theropod dinosaurs, the theropod dinosaurs being the ones that mostly ate meat, although there were a few herbivorous groups that also evolved in the group. This is because as a whole, the theropods have very highly serrated teeth, and you can look at many different kinds of this and it pretty much holds no matter what group you're looking at. For example, in things like Acrocanthosaurus, you can see there's a whole bunch of these little ridges, serrations, called denticles. You can also look at things like the raptor dinosaurs, and they have similar serrations. But then in things like the Truodontids, you have these much larger, lumpier denticles, and that means potentially they were doing something different with what they were eating, and there's been a lot of questions as to what that was, including potentially eating plants, at least some of the time. This idea that they were omnivorous has actually shown up in a lot of media, including the kids show Dinosaur Train. Unfortunately, it's also been pretty hard to prove that the Trudontids may have been omnivorous. In fact, with Stenonychosaurus, one genus of Trudontid, it's been pretty well shown that they were hunting at least some of the time, because they have offset ears the same way that owls do, and owls use those offset ears to actually pinpoint locations of small prey in the dark easier. So potentially the true dontids were doing something like that. There's even regurgitates that contain a lot of small mammal bones that may have potentially been from the same behavior of coughing up pellets. But this paper tried to solve some of those problems by looking at isotopes. And isotopes can change over time, but oftentimes they're very situational to where the organism is. So for example, someone living in Vancouver is going to have an entirely different amount of strontium in their body than someone living in Des Moines. And that's largely because the rocks that make up those different areas are going to have different elements in them, and that's going to get into the soil, into the food, and then into the body, and you are what you eat after all. So that's really important for understanding certain patterns. But these kinds of isotope differences can also be done at a much finer scale than just Vancouver to Des Moines, which is a massive area. You can actually find differences in just single environments, because certain plants will pick up different isotopes in the environment. And then as those plants get eaten by herbivores, those herbivores will have a higher concentration of those isotopes. And then those get eaten by carnivores, and then those get eaten by carnivores again, and it continually just concentrates the ratios of certain isotopes. And by measuring teeth, if they are unchanged through the geologic process, we can actually understand what these animals may have been doing. Now, the first step for this study was showing that the Oldman Formation in Alberta actually was relatively unchanged, because different geologic processes can actually change these isotopes during diagenesis, essentially as the mud and sand that was deposited is turned into a hard stone. And what they did for this is they took a bunch of isotopes from the soil, or the paleo soil, and were able to compare that to many different environments. And what you can see is they line up pretty much where you would expect they would. They're all the white dots in this graph. You can also see where certain formations have actually undergone more change because they've been underground longer or under heavier pressures underground. And there's this low grade metamorphic trend where some of these isotopes don't line up as well. This meant the researchers could sample a bunch of different organisms, and specifically their teeth, because teeth are growing throughout an animal's lifetime, so you get a good sample of what it would have been doing throughout its lifetime. And what that means is you can see a lot of different trends, including, for example, with the Trudontids, them plotting somewhat between the large herbivores in the environment, things like the Ceratopsians, and Ankylosaurs, and the Hadrosaurs, and other predators such as the dromaeosaurs or the raptor dinosaurs. And then of course you have the largest predators in the environment, the tyrannosaurids, which you can see the tyrannosaurids are very, very high up on parts of this graph. They're very concentrated in certain elements. And all of this data actually looks even better when it's plotted in 3D. And that's because you can see, even with just the herbivores, they're all slightly different in their ratios. And that means they're probably doing niche partitioning, going after different food sources and different plants. Meanwhile, again, you have the Tyrannosaurids way up at the top, but also even just from the Trudontids to the Dromaeosaurs, you can see there is a gap where they are going after different foods. They are partitioning into different niches. They're not directly competing with each other all of the time. I will also take a moment to point at this mammal group here, though, because it has some pretty large error bars, and that's probably mostly due to a relatively small sample size. Small things fossilize worse than large things but also just because there's a lot of mammal variation out there and potentially they were just going after different foodstuffs. Some may have been going after seeds and some may have been going after small worms and things like that. 
meaning there could be a lot of variation in the overall group that we don't necessarily see in the other animals. Also, mammal teeth don't grow throughout their entire lives, so it could potentially just be a bias towards certain times when those teeth were growing in those organisms' life. Now, I do have one concern with this study, specifically the conclusions on Trudon being omnivorous. I would be interested in seeing how certain isotopes of different animals actually do line up with this, specifically with owls versus modern-day raptor birds. And that's specifically because owls are more likely to swallow their prey whole, meaning they are going to get some of those gut contents from things like mice that could hold seeds. And that may in turn change their specific body chemistry differently than what would affect things like hawks, which are more likely to tear up pieces of their prey. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that owls and hawks raptors are a perfect analog for what was happening in the fossil record. But I am just curious if potentially Trudontids eating prey whole especially small prey that could have been feeding on plants, could have altered their body chemistry at least to some degree. I don't think it would account for the entire broad difference we see for how much carbon that they had in certain isotopes. However, I think it is something worth investigating. And it would take a lot of work to try and get all the isotopes for that in modern animals, and then compare it and try and understand exactly what proportion of that carbon came from the things that they were eating that were meat, versus how much of the plants they were deliberately targeting. Of course, we could also just get one really, really wonderful fossil of a true daunted with gut contents that show what plants it was eating, but that's not very likely to happen. So for right now, I think this is the best study that we have that really shows that we can start reconstructing some of these large-scale trophic webs and try to understand how different animals were using the environment in different or in similar ways sometimes.